It's blamed Tehran for the attack on Saudi oil facilities. Now the U.S. says it's building a coalition against Iran. But can that guarantee security in the Gulf region? Or would diplomacy be a better choice? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. The Gulf region is on the edge. Who's responsible for last week's attacks on Saudi oil infrastructure, which have led to accusations from all of the different sides? The US and Saudi Arabia say Iran is behind the Aramco strikes, but the Houthis in Yemen say they are responsible and they've warned of more to come. The US Secretary of State visited allies in Saudi Arabia and the UAE to hold talks with their leaders. Mike Pompeo said Washington was seeking a peaceful resolution to the crisis, but blamed Iran for seeking an all-out war. Iran's foreign minister says the U.S. is preparing to use the Aramco incident as an excuse to attack his country, and that Tehran's ready to defend itself. Uh, there will be more sanctions. Uh, we're, we're, we, uh, we, we have set about a course of action to deny Iran the capacity and the wealth so that they can conduct their terror, so to, pre to prevent them from conducting their terror campaigns. And you can see from the events of last week, there's still more work to do, and we're going to continue to drive towards that end. Uh, you, you, you cannot fail to see the failed policy of giving money to this regime by what happened in Saudi Arabia. Iran's foreign minister has responded, criticizing Americans' involvement in the war in Yemen. Mohammed Javad Sarif tweeted a list of crimes he accused the Saudi-led and U.S.-backed coalition of committing in Yemen, saying, Four years of bombing has left 100,000 Yemenis dead, millions malnourished and suffering from cholera. But when Yemen carries out retaliatory strikes on Saudi oil tankers, the U.S. calls it an unacceptable act of war. In another tweet, Zarif says Iran has been more responsible, calling for peace and security in the Gulf and putting forward peace plans for Yemen and Syria. Let's bring in our guest. Nadir Hashemi is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. He's joining us here in Doha. Mohammed Morandi is professor of American studies at the University of Tehran, and he joins us from Tehran. And Adolfo Franco is a Republican strategist, former advisor to Senator John McCain. He joins us from Washington, D.C. A welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in D.C. first with uh, Adolfo Franco. Right. Now, what we're seeing right now is a fairly impotent reaction uh, from Washington to these attacks on the Aramco oil facilities. We're seeing a lot of a blame game going on. It's being blamed on the Iranians. The Houthis say it was actually them, but no real reactions. There has been some sort of sanctions. The US has always prided itself on securing oil out of the Gulf. It's been a 30-year relationship that way. Has that now changed? No, not at all. And I do not believe it's been a, a weak response. And I don't think the full response has yet to be heard. Uh, the president obviously has been briefed, in fact, extensively yesterday. And today will actually be presented with a, a series of options. And those options range from, frankly, full out military strike and retaliation uh, against Iran to everywhere, everything to additional and more strengthened sanctions. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have a long stand, stand a decades old uh, policy of alliances with the Gulf states, and we will continue to protect their assets, uh, their security. There's no question about doing so. However, the United States will not act unilaterally without consultations that Secretary Pompeo has done precisely with those allies to see the scope of what they deem to be an appropriate response. This is clear aggression uh, by I Iran. Uh, we know the, the origin of these comes from the north, northwest. That's not <laughs> the geography that would uh, point to Yemen. And even if it were Yemen, which it is not, of course, that would be Iranian uh, sponsored and uh, controlled, as is the situation in Hezbollah and other places where they use their proxies. So this is clearly Iran uh, in every shape, way, and form. 
The response to the United States is yet to be heard. There are U.S. senators calling for a very strong military reaction toward Iran, and the president has said everything's on the table. And as he has said the other day, we're locked and loaded, uh, meaning he's prepared to do a military response as necessary. Mohammed Mirandi in uh, Tehran. The U.S. is locked and loaded. It clearly blame, uh, blames Iran for all of this. Is it Iran? So we're supposed to believe that a swarm of drones and missiles either crossed the Persian Gulf or came from the north of the Persian Gulf all the way down, across, uh, passing by U.S. military bases, uh, naval ships, and the huge military presence that Western countries have across the, the Persian Gulf region. And then the Saudis with hundreds of billions of dollars of American weapons based of, all over the place, and all of them directed, mo most of them directed towards Iran, because that's how the Saudis have spent their money over the last few decades. Yet none of these drones were detected. None of these missiles were detected. I don't think anyone here takes that very seriously. When the Americans sent a $200 million drone into Iranian airspace just a few months ago, minutes after it entered Iranian airspace, it was downed by an Iranian-made surface-to-air missile. So perhaps the Saudis should buy Iranian-made products instead of American-made products. And then there's the other argument that until now, whenever drone strikes were carried out by uh, the Yemeni resistance and the Yemeni armed forces, the Western pundits would say that these weapons came from Iran and they were sent to Yemen. Yet that narrative suddenly has disappeared in this attack. So while the strikes have become more and more impressive over the last few months, deeper inside Saudi t territory, with greater preci precision, suddenly they, they no longer make that claim about Yemen. So no one here believes the you American know. argument, and we know how the Americans uh, falsify <laughs> information for the sake of their uh, own foreign policy agenda. But, but if the Americans make, and the Amer it, is, it is true that the Americans are allies of Saudi Arabia. They've been allies when they helped create mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda, when they help, and then the blowback was 9-11. They've been allies when the Saudis have been spreading extremism across the world because it was in the interest of the United States. They've been allies for a very long time. That's absolutely correct. Let me bring in Adolfo Franco here. There right. is this idea that uh, yeah, the Saudis I, are yeah. very embarrassed um, that the Houthis managed to mount an attack such as this, and it's just convenient uh, to blame mm, Iran. That's that. what we're hearing mm. from the Iranian side, certainly. There's something illogical about uh, my colleague's uh, rationale. He just said that it was implausible that something could attack, uh, drones could attack Saudi fields because they're armed to the teeth and the sophistication, and this is just impossible. Yet, uh, they can be coming from Yemen, and somehow that's plausible. Either it's implausible, and this was all a setup by Saudi Arabia and the United States, which, you know, if you believe conspiracy theories, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, but the evidence is otherwise, since the material that has been examined is Iranian. But that's not what I said. Uh, so if, if the... If, if the drone, if the drones can be, you just said that, that, that it's implausible to believe that that Saudi uh, you uh, facilities listening. would not be protected by sophisticated. Yes, I, I was I'm listening going, to I'm you. I'm going to just interrupt uh, very, you there for carefully. a second, the, Adolfo. The, the, that the, isn't the, actually the, what Mohammed Morandi is, said. Actually, what he said but, was but, that no but, one in Amer no one of the American forces that were based on there's a lot of them in the region noticed these swarm of drones coming over. Let's just leave it there for a second. We uh, let me bring in Nader Hashmi here. Um, clearly, there is big differences on both sides when it comes to the narrative here. Um, is there a political way out of this, or are we at the stage where somebody is going to have to attack somebody else, somebody else's capital? Well, well there is a political way out of it, and, just, and it speaks to the point that was just discussed with your other two guests. Um, what we need right now is an international, independent, UN-led commission of inquiry to determine culpability and then accountability for the attack on the Saudi oil facilities. Now, it would be good to hear from the government of Saudi Arabia as to whether they would support such a UN-led independent inquiry, because when it comes to UN-led independent inquiries in the context of the war in Yemen, 
They've strongly opposed those independent inquiries. And the Islamic Republic of Iran has also had a horrific track record when it comes to uh, pursuing and accepting the results of UN-led independent inquiries with respect to regional destabilization. And I'm talking about um, what the UN uh, has said and done with respect to Iran's horrific involvement in Syria. Um, so I think that's one way of resolving this issue. That's the way forward. Um, um, in terms of the broader political uh, conflict that we see unfolding right now that has brought this region to the precipice, I think we're in desperate need of diplomacy. Uh, the problem is, is that um, there's very few options that we have that, um, that we can pursue with respect to a diplomatic settlement. Uh, the United States and Iran don't talk to one another. Um, Donald Trump has surrounded himself with a bunch of war hawks that have been very reluctant to pursue diplomacy, although Donald Trump, and I hate to say this, but Donald Trump, to his credit, has opened the door uh, to a dialogue with Iran. Unfortunately, uh, the authoritarian leaders in Tehran have no interest in pursuing dialogue. So I think this, this is, I think, the sticking point that needs to be resolved if we want to get away from uh, a disastrous war that we're on the precipice of. Uh, Adolfo Franco, would a UN inquiry satisfy uh, this U.S. administration? I would be all in favor of that. I can't imagine the administration wouldn't as well, but there's only one problem with that. Uh, in principle, that sounds nice. Theoretic, from a theory, a theoretical point of view, the point is, is this. I think Iran, as it has done in the past, would just reject it. So what? This is at the, at the, end, of the, 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 at the end of the day, UN. So therefore, I don't know how long that inquiry would, would, would take. It would be contested. There's no question that the results of it. That's not some body that everybody would, would automatic, uh, a, 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 meaning the UN, a body that anyone would necessarily respect. And what would be the remedy afterwards? Let's say after this long, it would take a while, this long inquiry, Iran actually was the culprit. Then what happens? Uh, in terms of do we have a military strike six months from now in and, and retaliation? So that, that's one problem. But, but the comment made about diplomacy is an important one. It's Foreign Minister Sarif who has taken diplomacy and uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei who has taken them off the table when the instructions have been given to speak to no American official. President Trump has never said that. He said to no American official, including uh, the officials in New York. There were some in, our, in Washington who had advocated to revoke the visas for the Iranian delegation to even travel to the U.N. Uh, uh, meetings to, uh, next week in, in New York. And that was rejected by President Trump. I think President Trump is open to the dialogue. The problem is Iran. But at the end of the day, the culprit in the region for the instability is Iran. We know that, whether it's in Syria, Lebanon, or, or Yemen. This is the regime that has been exporting terrorism, and as a consequence of very tough sanctions, which are now going to be stiffened, Iran is lashing out. I, I understand it from a standpoint of global politics that Iran has few options, since it's unable to break through the sanctions with European allies to do, resort to military threats to say, this is what's going to happen if these sanctions continue. But the culprit for all of, the, for all of these activities beyond this incident is Iran. Mohamed Miranda, your reaction, please. Well, I disagree with both of your guests. First of all, with regards to Syria, the UN did nothing until 2013. And when Iran actually entered Syria was when there were already, already tens of thousands of foreign fighters who were funded and brought into the country. If it wasn't for Iran, we'd have black flags flying both over Damascus and Baghdad. Not it's true. absolutely correct, and it's well documented. That's a just, that, that's Hezbollah, propaganda. It's absolutely true. And Hezbollah actually entered Syria no. in the middle of 2013. Iran has been supporting Assad and from to day the, one. Stop the shame lying, of Mohammed. of many who were silent about the... Look at the Stop Defense lying. Intelligence Agency document of 2012, which be belongs to your own government. Have a bit of uh, from be a the bit beginning of this be beginning of the Syrian war, Iran has been backing a war criminal. It's and reflective you know it. of your government's Stop behavior. Lying. The and human two, rights the 2012 Defense Intelligence Agency document of the United for States. Anyone to read. If you if you don't allow me to talk, it just is reflective of the regime in Washington's behavior, how it silences any sort of critique. Iranians have no voice anywhere. If they can't have five minutes on Al Jazeera, then that's really saying They don't not, have it in their own country either because of so your the, policies. I, I advise all of your viewers to so go and read. No, I we will get to you. Let's, let's allow I Mohammed Tabi to say. Uh, no, yes, he, he won't yeah. let me talk. The US, I advise your viewers to what? read the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012, where the United States 
we, and that organization was led by um, General Flynn, Michael Flynn. Uh, he, he also in Al Jazeera stated that the United States allowed the extremists, uh, they allowed their allies in the region to support the extremists, and the extremists had the upper hand in the fighting, and they, according to the document, were trying to create a Salafist uh, entity between Syria and Iraq. This was early on in the fighting, and Iran came well after that. But with regards to when we talk about the UN, let's look at Yemen. The UN only had the Saudi regime on their blacklist for 72 hours, and then they removed it. So when we talk about the UN, we're not talking about an unbiased body. The UN, when Saddam Hussein invaded Iran, they never condemned the aggressor during the war. And when they used chemical weapons, and yeah, I survived two chemical attacks, and friends of mine didn't, when, when chemical weapons were used in Iran, the UN Security Council never condemned the United States or Saddam Hussein or any of the European countries who supported them. But the real story here is the war in Yemen, which uh, is, is quite obvious, the most horrific story in the 21st century. This war has to come to an end. The Saudi regime, if they do not want their assets to be targeted, the only way forward is for them to stop bombing schools, stop bombing hospitals, funerals, weddings, school buses, and, and starving the country with the help of the United States and others. Any support that the Iranians have given to the people of Yemen in their resistance against the uh, Saudi aggression is nothing compared to what the United States and its allies in oh, the region please. and oh, its please. allies in Europe have done for Saudi Arabia. Adolfo, oh, I will get you in just a second. Oh, I want to bring in Nader Hashim here, okay. Hashimi here in uh, Doha. Yeah. You heard what our guest in Tehran, Mohammed Morandi, had to say. It's all yeah. about Yemen. This is where we're at and this is what needs to change. Yeah. However, you seem to have some strong opinions. I would agree with him that the war in Yemen is horrific and it has uh, destabilized the region and it has led to a huge humanitarian catastrophe. But so has the war in Syria, which Mohammed Miranda is defending yes. um, in terms of Iranian participation. That has killed, you know, roughly half a million people. And Iran has very bloody hands for what it has been doing in Yemen. So there's a lot of regional instability that's taking place. No, and I think if you want to be objective, if you want to be objective, one has to be able to attribute blame to all of the destabilizing actors. Yeah. That's Saudi Arabia. That's the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's which the is state your of American Israel. Government. And that's also the United States government. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, the difference between Mohammed Morandi and I is that I'm not a, an apologist for the United States government. In fact, I'm very critical of U.S. foreign policy, both in the past and the present, yeah. unlike him, who's a crass apologist for everything that comes out of the mouth of Ali Khamenei. Well, let's bring in Adolfo Franco yeah, here. Well, let's I, also, I gentlemen, try attitude. and keep you this... Hold the language that you use reflects what, who you are. Yeah. Let's, let's keep this civilized. Uh, yeah, Adolfo no, Franco, I, it's very difficult I, for the Iranians to come to the negotiating table mm -hmm. if you keep... Uh, putting sanctions on them, if you sanction their senior leadership, it becomes very difficult for them to actually yeah. sell it to their people and come back to the negotiating table. What's the way out for the U.S. here? Well, this... Well, number one, you're absolutely right, and this is precisely why uh, Iran launched this attack, in my opinion, against Saudi Arabia. It's to demonstrate that they have no options but to flex their muscles in the region and send a warning shot, which was heard in Saudi Arabia and the, uh, and the Gulf states that uh, this could mean all-out war, which the, the Saudi Arabia and, its, and, and, and the UAE does not, does not want. So uh, the, the, way, the way out of the... But here's the bigger problem for the United States. And I, I, I really respect the, the other guest who I disagree with in, in, in Doha, uh, because he is right. He is he's critical of the U.S., but he's also critical of, of the other side. So I have a different view, but I, I give him a lot of credit uh, for, for his honesty. Uh, let me say this. From our standpoint, we have very hard options. This is not an easy way out. The problem is we're, how we got here, which I do not want to repeat the history, the failed policies of the previous uh, American administration, and frankly, even other administrations were weak on Iran, that Iran we are, is, is now on the cusp and has been on the cusp, of, of course, of becoming a nuclear power. That, that is, from my perspective, what drives our policy. Uh, the problem is 
uh, and I think the president was right, he's saying we're not going to feel good for five or six years of buying security and then, and then actually license Iran to almost have, under the agreement, the ability to develop uh, nuclear weapons in, in, uh, in, in a few years. So he bit the bullet, meaning the president, by that expression I mean he decided uh, very directly to say, this is not going to happen. We're going to put pressure uh, on Iran through sanctions to change uh, its policy and to really call it what it is, which, which is a terrorist state. Uh, the problem with, or the problem, or, or the challenge for us right now is, um, I think there will be stiffer uh, uh, sanctions coming, but the options become more difficult. It is a question of whether Iran will really come through uh, with its threats and, and escalate and continue to do these the types of activities it's been engaged in, and then, frankly, lead to a, a confrontation, or whether Iran will come to its senses uh, after it does this types of antics and decide I, I, because of sanctions, but but by scoring some points to have the West come and suggest uh, discussions and agree to those. I would hope it would be the latter. But the president is not going to change course uh, on sanctions. That is for sure. And, in fact, there might be some military response if our allies are aligned. Ultimately, our, our goal is to change the Iranian regime's behavior. Uh, and that is our goal. And our goal is to keep it from becoming a nuclear power in the region. Adolfo Franco, thank you very much. I want to bring in Mohammed Mirandi here. Uh, I, and I want to come to Doha as well and to you, Nader Hashmi, but we are running out of time. So very quickly, Mohammed Mirandi, it's the sanctions that are the real issue here. If the sanctions are lifted, the Iranians will come back to the negotiating table. Is that the upshot of it? No, it's not at all that. It's U.S. aggression in this region, just like in Syria. As we know in WikiLeaks, the United States knew Saudi Arabia was supporting ISIS, and they were destroying Syria, and, and they, they hide the reality like your two guests do. And I also disagree that Trump uh, is, did not, uh, your guests in Doha said, Trump opened the door for negotiations. That's nonsense. The United States is yes. engaging in economic warfare against ordinary Iranians. The Iranians were sitting with the United States at the negotiating table, and that was the United States that left the table after tearing up the agreement. The Iranians signed the nuclear agreement in order to create stability in this region, and they gave significant concessions to get there, but, the, but Trump tore that agreement. The Iranians have said if the U.S. goes back to the deal that they will accept a new state of affairs, meaning negotiations can take place. So it's up to the United States, not to the, not the Iranians. Iran's not going to appease the United States. And finally, Saudi Arabia is heading towards a cliff, and so is the United Arab Emirates, whether your guests like it or not. They cannot continue this war with, with Yemen and get away with it. The Yemenis are, going, are getting stronger. The Saudis are getting weaker. The Saudis ha are unable to protect themselves despite spending hundreds of billions of dollars, wasting their money, giving them to the United States. And the United States has shown nothing for all its presence in the region. They, they, the United States is only creating instability. And you, believe you me that if the war in Sorry, Yemen Mohammed, continues... Sorry, Mohammed, we are running out of time. Saudi I do Arabia want to come to Nader Arab Hashmi Emirates as well. So will not I'm going to have to fate. stop you there. Uh, Nader, this is uh, once again all about the politics of this, it's sanctions, it's about the regional players, Saudi Arabia, it's about Iran, it's about the US role. Uh, Saudi Arabia seems to be reliant on uh, the US. Uh, often it's been said that Saudi Arabia will fight any, more, any war to the last American. Is that a bad policy? Is that a failed policy? Should things change for Saudi Arabia? Well, Saudi Arabia, the, the, the House of Saud, uh, they're not getting much sleep these days because they were hoping that Donald Trump would be their savior. So they're in a state of shock right now that on two occasions when Trump had the opportunity to strike at Iran that they haven't. So there's going to be a lot of soul searching in Saudi Arabia about its relationship with the United States. I don't think they have many good options. Um, but these are difficult days for the dictators in Riyadh. But more broadly speaking, I think in terms of diplomacy, next week is a unique opportunity when all of the heads of state of the members of the UN will be in New York. Uh, the French proposal, which we haven't talked about, which, lo which looked like it had some legs, which looked like it could sort of be perhaps a way out of this conundrum, needs to be revived. And, um, you know, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, will be there as well. Uh, Rouhani will be there. So will Trump. Let's hope that cooler heads prevail and there can be a way out of this disastrous um, conflict that's the responsibility of all of the 
uh, dictators and authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, including the international players led by the United States, which, you know, has to bear a lot of responsibility for this. And I'm afraid we Donald are Trump. out of time. I want to thank all our guests, Nader Hashemi, Mohamed Mirandi and Adolfo Franco. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme anytime uh, by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.